أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Honorable Chief Guest, Mr. General Amr Nadeem, former Chairman Sparko, esteemed speakers, Dr. Adil Sultan, Dean of Faculty of Aerospace and Strategic Studies, Air University, Dr. Ali Sarosh, Associate Professor, Air University, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Chairman BOG, ISSI, Ambassador Suhail Mahmood, Director General, ISSI, distinguished participants, Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. My name is Malik Asim Mustafa and I am Director at Arms Control and Disarmament Center at the Institute. And on behalf of the Institute and the Center, I warmly welcome you all to today's seminar on Pakistan's space policy, tapping into the space potential. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, Pakistan initiated a space program with the establishment of Sparco almost six to seven decades ago. Since then, with its existing resources, Pakistan has been utilizing space technologies for socio-economic and sustainable development. The country is applying this technology for earth observation, remote sensing, agriculture, forestry, disaster management, water resource management, environment protection, and many other related areas. However, today the world has entered into a second space age, where major powers are involved in a space race and in a space competition. They are investing huge resources to develop and modernize their space programs with dual-use capabilities. Pakistan is vigilant of this development and attaches great importance to research and development in the field of space science space technology, and its application for peaceful purposes and for socio-economic uplift of the country. Most recently, in December 2023, Pakistan declared its first national space policy with a vision to exploit space science and technology to improve quality of life of people of Pakistan while safeguarding national interest and sovereignty. Ladies and gentlemen, this policy, which our experts here are going to discuss in detail today, mainly revolves around research and development and application of space technology for peaceful <coughs> purposes, indigenization and international cooperation, uh, space education, space laws and regulations, and above all, achieving a sustainable and secure space environment. With this in view, the Arms Control and Disarmament Center have organized this seminar to discuss uh, this policy and that how Pakistan is utilizing space technology and how it can further develop its space potential to achieve socio-economic development and other related goals. Ladies and gentlemen, with these remarks, now I would like to invite Ambassador Suhail Mahmood, 
Director General SSI for his welcome remarks. Mr. Suhail Mahmood has been a career foreign service officer with diplomatic experience spanning 37 years that included various assignments at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as Pakistan's mission abroad in both bilateral and multilateral arenas. He served as the 30th Foreign Secretary of Pakistan. Prior to his appointment as Foreign Secretary, he served as Pakistan's High Commissioner to India, Pakistan Ambassador to Turkey, Thailand, a permanent representative to Europe, our Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. Ambassador Mahmood's diplomatic assignments abroad also include working as Pakistan's mission in Ankara, Washington, as well as New York, including a political coordinator for Pakistan's delegation to the UN Security Council. Sir, you have the floor. Sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Qasim. Uh, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Chairman BOG ISSI, Major General Retired Ahmed Nadeem, former Chairman Sparko, Excellencies, uh, esteemed speakers, distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome everyone to this seminar on Pakistan's space policy, tapping into the space potential. <clears throat> we are pri privileged to have a panel of eminent speakers, including academics, area experts, practitioners, and decision makers, who would shed light on various aspects of this important subject from their respective vantage points. We all stand to benefit from their insightful contributions. As we all know, the role of space technology has increased manifold in the functioning of contemporary societies. More and more countries are resorting to space technology and increasingly using space technology applications to tackle traditional socioeconomic development issues as well. That is why Pakistan is also looking to further develop its potential to explore the peaceful uses of this technology. Pakistan is among the early starters in this domain worldwide, and the establishment of SPARCO way back in 1961 helped commence both our research, space research activities as well as a systematic development of the National Space Program. Over the past many decades, we have strengthened our indigenous capacities, deepened international collaboration, and crafted a long-term vision. For all this, SPARCO is to be commended for its consistent endeavors. Pakistan's foray into space has not just been about launching satellites or conducting scientific experiments. It has equally been about harnessing the space's limitless possibilities for the country's socioeconomic development as well as security. Pakistan's space policy encapsulates its aspirations for progress, innovation, and global competitiveness. Today's seminar has been organized to explore the myriad facets of Pakistan's first ever national space policy, approved by the Cabinet on 13th de December 2023. It is indeed important to fully understand the objectives and to assess its potential in propelling the country into the forefront of space technology and exploration. The National Space Policy clearly outlines the purposes, principles, and the thrust areas that the government considers essential for the further development of Pakistan's space sector. And the policy envisions the development of a space sector that caters to innovation and in indigenous development of technologies. It envisages a strong link amongst the government, media, R&D institutions, and the industry. Some of its key focus areas include space technology applications for socioeconomic development and national security, development of facilities, infrastructure, and space professionals, research and development in science, technology, and innovation, development of the local industry and commercialization of space products and services, space education and awareness, and public-private partnership. In essence, at the heart of the space policy lies a commitment to leveraging space technology for the betterment of our society. From enhancing communication networks to monitoring natural disasters and from advancing agricultural practices to bolstering national security, the applications of space technology are diverse, 
and far-reaching. By tapping into this potential more substantially, Pakistan will be able to effectively address pressing challenges and unlock new opportunities for growth and prosperity. The national space policy demonstrates the government's determination and dedication to achieving self-sufficiency in space science, space technology, and its applications for peaceful uses of outer space. It is hoped that the policy would be implemented with vigor and on an accelerated pace. I once again thank all the speakers for sparing the time and graciously agreeing to share their expertise. Their insights and perspectives will enrich the deliberations and help foster deeper understanding of Pakistan's space policy and its potential benefits in diverse fields. I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite Ms. Ghazala Yasmin, one of our researchers here at the ACDC, uh, to give an overview of Pakistan's space program. Ms. Yasmin has almost 20 years of experience in the field of arms control and disarmament. She is a prolific writer with publications in both national and international journals, covering a range of issues including India's space program, the space weapons race, and Pakistan's space program. Over to you, Ms. Ghazala Yasmin. Thank you so much, um, and good morning to everyone. Uh, in the next five minutes or so, I will try to take you uh, through Pakistan's space journey. Um, before I talk about Pakistan uh, specifically, I'd like to highlight uh, the global uh, context and the important, uh, importance of space technology today. Tapping into space potential is vital for a country's economic growth today. Satellites play a vital role in every facet of life, from navigation, agriculture, urban planning, disaster management, water resource management, health and industry. And it also plays an important role in a nation's socioeconomic development. It also helps promote the uh, UN's uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, it can thus be a lucrative way to boost a country's economy. Just to give you an idea, uh, in 2022, the global space economy was worth $546 billion. And uh, as you can see from this uh, uh, bar graph, it is projected to go up uh, in the next few years. Then coming to Pakistan's national space policy, as uh, mentioned earlier, it was approved in December 2023. And it essentially aims to develop and enhance Pakistan's space industry, promote international collaboration, and strengthen domestic capabilities in space science and technology. Um, there's a space uh, vis policy vision as well, uh, as you can see on the screen. The key components of uh, national policy include the development of laws, regulation mechanisms to regulate space activities, as well as the cultivation of expertise in space law and regulatory issues. Essentially, the policy focuses on developing space sector with the aim to reduce our dependency on others um, and moving towards self-reliance. And much emphasis is uh, uh, on making a viable and sustainable uh, space program. Pakistan has a modest space program, uh, as mentioned earlier uh, as well. It was founded in 1961 and was amongst the first 10 space agencies um, in the world. Uh, these are some of the um, uh, satellites that Pakistan has launched over the years. Um, the space journey started in 1961 uh, with the Rehber sounding ro rocket. Um, for upper atmospheric research in collaboration with China and with technology assistance from space agencies in the US, Britain, and France. Uh, then Badr-1 um, was first digital communication satellite. It was launched into low Earth orbit in uh, uh, 1999 with the help of a Chinese rocket again. And Badr-2 uh, was launched in December 2021 with assistance from Russia. And it, is, it aimed to acquire Earth imagery for experimental purposes and to support the scientific community in Pakistan. China has played a significant role in Pakistan's space program, offering access to space technology and infrastructure. The collaboration has resulted in the, in the launch of 
Park Set 1R. It's Pakistan's first communication satellite. In August 2021, it provides broadcasting, internet, data communication services in Pakistan and regions of South Asia, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe and parts of East Africa. Uh, Suparco's so notable achievements include the launch of two indigenous um, satellites, uh, uh, P PRSS-1 and PARC-S-1A using Chinese assistance in 2018. So Pakistan's Earth Observation Remote Sensing and Communication Satellites make Pakistan somewhat self-reliant in communication and high-resolution imaging while providing a wide range of different services to the nation and valuable scientific data to global science communities. Uh, with the launch of uh, National Space Policy, it envisages the launch of a series of communication, remote sensing, and navigation satellites to speed up the space of socioeconomic development and national security. Uh, now, uh, these are all the um, uh, fields that Pakistan is already using space technology in. Uh, there are other speakers that will be speaking in more detail on this, so I will not dwell in on this one. Uh, then Pakistan also has uh, uh, international cooperation. Uh, it has permanent membership of several international organizations, institutes, scientific committees, and United Nations bodies. And Suparco has also many bilateral and multilateral co cooperation agreements for collaboration in space-related activities. Then these are the five space uh, uh, law treaties that Pakistan is uh, a member of. It's a, a signatory to these. Uh, these are Outer Space Treaty, the Moon Agreement, Reliability Convention, Registration Convention, and the Rescue uh, Agreement. Internationally, Pakistan's stance has always been uh, uh, that space is a global commons and needs to be preserved for peaceful uses only. It has always opposed the militarization and weaponization of outer space. And it has always been a strong uh, advocate of the prevention of arms race in outer space uh, initiative and supports International Code of Conduct of Outer Space, endorses UN Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines and Guidelines for the Long-Term Sustainability of Outer Space Activities. Um, national Space Policy is a, is a step in the right direction and aims to tackle many challenges faced by space program. Uh, however, Pakistan has a long way to go in order to achieve full potential. Commitment by the government and all relevant stakeholders is vital. Public-private partnership is in, important in invigorating the country's space program. Today, an effective space program is not an option, but a necessity, an engine for economic growth and socioeconomic development. And I would like to end by a quote by Elon Musk. I could either watch it happen or be part of it. And Pakistan must not watch it. It must be part of it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kazara. Uh, now we'll move towards our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Adis Roche, Associate Professor, Air University. And he's going to speak on space technology for sustainable development in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Roche is an experienced researcher and teacher in aerospace system and technologies. He holds a PhD in space vehicle design and a master degree in space propulsion technologies. He has extensively published journal work in space system designs, hypersonic technologies, development of sustainable peace policies, studies for nascent space powers, and counter space operations. He has been principal investigator of more than 15 high-end industrial research work funded by NASCOM, Sparco, PAF, HEC. He is the inventor of two design patents in hypersonic launch system and rocket-based com combined cycle engines. He has also served as the head of uh, technical advisory committee uh, for the Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of Pakistan, and he is also a recipient of Imtiazi uh, Sanad by the Government of Pakistan. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> Honorable Chair, uh, scholars and students, assalamu alaikum. And good morning. 
I start my talk with a very important quote from the former director of United Nations Office of Outer Space Activity, Simone de Pippo. It's from an article from December 2018, because my topic is Space Technologies for Sustainable Development, and uh, this article was written on the same aspect. Dr. Pippo stated, and I quote, utilizing space contributes positively to a range of policy areas. With adoption of the three major international frameworks in 2015, namely the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction between 2015 and 2030, and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The international community has pledged to address the biggest challenges defining our era. Space-based technologies play an ever-increasing role in accelerating the achievement of those pledges. I unquote. The statement of Dr. Pepo was a, stat was a testament enough to establish the credibility of space technologies as a guarantor for sustainable development as it came from the highest office of space program in the world. The first part gets therefore naturally justified that space technologies will contribute to the sustainable development. But how will they contribute? That's the question. And that in turn entails three more research questions. Is there a sustainability model for implementing the space technologies as Dr. Pippo had referred to? What are the specific space technologies that support the fulfillment of UN SDGs? And most importantly, Pakistan's space policy of 2023, can it actually promote the space technologies that help in achievement of SDGs? Let me tackle the first question first, because of course, if time, I can't go into details, so I'm going to touch upon all the aspects. 25th October 2021, UN General Assembly overwhelmingly passes the resolution 763, Space 2030 Agenda. In many ways, the Space 2030 Agenda serves as the reference sustainability model and a one-stop for mapping any space policy to UN's SDGs of 2030. Thus, for gauging the health of Pakistan's space policy, from the SDG standpoint, the Space 2030 Agenda possibly serves as the most apt baseline. It would help one identify the opportunities for improvement, in our space policy, and there are of course many. But before I evaluate the Pakistan space policy with the 2030 agenda, let me make an assessment of the specific space technologies that are shaping the fulfillment of SDGs. There are 17 SDGs we all know. Each SDG can be elaborated in detail, but I have positive time, so I'm going to lump together the SDGs with common technology requirements. SDG 1, Poverty Eradication, and SDG 2, which is Zero Hunger. Both SDGs rely on remote sensing payload and satellite data processing facilities to acquire terrestrial data that, that will monitor the crop yields, identify food insecurities, and improve agriculture practices. This is covered under National Space Policy Article 571. For SDG 3, which is Good Health and Well-Being, the availability of orbital space stations, ISS and Thingong, both are actively using modules for developing new medical treatments under microgravity environment. Also, the provision of the fifth and the sixth generation celestial broadband networks with ultra low latency are revolutionizing the, uh, the, the telemedicine services and monitoring of disease outbreaks. Unfortunately, these technologies are not listed in Pakistan's space policy. The provision of satellite broadcasting of educational programs, celestial broadband or for internet services, SpaceX is the example, and the space-based telecom te technologies are now contributing to SDG 4, which is education, quality of education, and gender equality by rapidly changing the access to educational resources, especially in the remote areas, and for monitoring the gender disparities occurring in the education sector. At the same time, the space telecom has also emerged as perhaps the biggest sector within the space industry that is opening new employment opportunities for women. This part is very partially covered under the space educational regime that, meant that goes in the space policy of Pakistan. The use of multispectral, hyperspectral, and synthetic aperture radar imaging from resource satellite is shaping the achievement of SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation, by monitoring the water quality, 
identifying the pollutants, and most importantly for Pakistan, it's actually providing the services of thermal imaging of glacial melting, which is Pakistan's top priority. The National Space Policy Article 573 and 575 both deal with this thing. That's a good part. Most recently, the advent of solar satellites, terrestrial habitats for alternate energy extraction like helium-3, which is, which, which is there on the, so the, the, the leeward face of the moon, electromagnetic transmission of energy from or, orbital sources to Earth are some of the s technologies of space that are transforming the landscape of SDG 7, which is affordable and clean energy. Pakistan's energy crises are so critical that they should have stimulated this inclusion of these technologies in our national space policy, but the space policy remains silent on this one. The SDGs 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all five of these, six of these, deal with making our planet a sustainable place for the coming generations. Most spacecraft in this category are scary scientific payloads. They are from the low Earth, medium Earth orbit, or even from the near Earth orbit constellations. The provision of space-based imagery, non-bathymetric payloads combined with geographic information system, integrated to augmented reality and artificial intelligence. They can revolutionize the procedure of monitoring the resources, predicting the consumption pattern of the Earth resources, and they are the direct contributors to fulfillment of SDG 10, SDG 11, and 12, which is responsible con consumption and production of the mineral resources. The National Space Policy, Article 574, covers this aspect. The increased use of LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging systems, aerosol sensing payloads aboard the meteorological satellite constellations are essentials for achieving the SDG 13 on climate action. They can do this by monitoring, understanding, and developing strategies for mitigation of climate change. And we don't have to repeat again because Pakistan is one of the top 10 most affected countries in this regard. The NSP 5, Article 5, 0.7.5 also covers this aspect. Additionally, with a large swath of southern port, the use of space-based bathymetric technologies is best suited to cover the SDG 14, life below water, that will help us monitor and protect marine ecosystem and to manage marine resources, which is also covered in the Article 5.7.10 of the space policy. Now, given our unique Hostile, volatile, west and east frontiers. The implementation of SDG 16 for peace, justice and strong institution implies that technologies which are necessary for establishing peace and security, especially in the wake of non-state actors. The use of space-based real-time moving target imagery, RMTI, and street of coverage constellations for high resolution, low latency uh, imaging can revolutionize the entire security imperative. The national policy, unfortunately, remains silent on this aspect. In general, if I put all these together, the Pakistan's national space policy expresses the desire to achieve UN SDGs, but on certain account, it falls short of nailing specific space technologies ne necessary to achieving the SDGs from our perspective. Therefore, there is a legitimate reason for a third question to be asked when that becomes very important, that can Pakistan's space policy of 2023, in its current form, in its present form, uh, afford us the attainment of SDGs? For that, I begin with the first part, which uh, Ms. Ghazala has also mentioned, the cooperation. Cooperation is a, in contemporary times is necessary for space programs. Cooperation starts with transparency, and transparency lies at the heart of space policy. So a well-defined and fairly honest space policy is needed for, the clear, for, for creating the transparency. From modern technological perspectives, any modern space policy must contain four policy elements. The first is a very well thought out and very well defined strategic vision into a foreseeable future with the rapidly evolving changes in technologies and global dynamics. The national space policy gives us policy vision, which is very brief in that regard. A definition, second thing, a second thing is the definition of a strategic and technological constraints under which the space policy is being crafted. This is a missing element in the space policy. A realistic, <coughs> sorry, 
realistic and a well-defined goals for sustainable development implementation of the space policy, and the space policy covers a lot of these goals, but there is room for further improvement. And fourth is the evolutionary mechanism to guide the future decisions regarding strategic and technological goals evolution over the next decades. This will make the space policy a living document. The NSP, Article 4.5 and 5.4 cover this aspect. So there are certain aspects which are covered, certain which, are, which need improvement. Coming back to the strategic vision and foundation, the UN space agenda as well as the US space policy of 2010, the EU space policy, the China national space agenda, all have a very elaborate strategic vision about their space programs. The Space 2030 agenda, for example, envisions seven well-defined thematic areas of total emphasis, four comprehensive objectives based on four very four core pillars. And those pillars, those pillars are space economy, space society, space accessibility, and space diplomacy. In comparison, Pakistan's space policy states a seven-point vision statement and defines seven objectives, which are very broadly defined and enlist eight major thrust areas. Those, the objectives are not exactly mapping uh, with the uh, thrust areas, and there, there's a room for improvement in that aspect. The thrust areas, on the other hand, are analogous to the seven thematic priorities of Unispace 50. If we compare the two, one can see that there's a general conformance with how our priority areas have been mapped to the UN Space 2030. However, being very overly simplified, the national space policy objectives and the thrust areas will, for a time being, have to rely on Agenda 2030 to extract meaningful and tangible interpretations in terms of their objectives and in terms of the technologies. The policy elements are analogous but slightly non-comprehensive. So there's a room for improvement. So I come to the last part, which is where we see opportunities for improvement in Pakistan's national space policy with respect to the technologies. Pakistan's security imperatives have long overshadowed the space technology economy perspective. This is known to everyone. And now, the military space sector has entirely disappeared from the national space policy. That is not right. It is an integral part of, the, of every space policy. The space policy may define our space segment as consisting of three fundamental sectors. The commercial space sector, the space or the civil space sector, and the military space sectors. This implies that the national space policy must include space sectoral and intersectoral guidelines to connect these working to connect these three sectors to work homogeneously together for the attainment of the UN SDGs and for the national vision uh, outcomes. Each of our space, space sector pursues specific SDGs, national targets alongside with their respective technologies needs. For example, we cannot uh, attain SDG 7 and 8 without the entire and full uh, wholehearted and unimpeded uh, involvement of the commercial space sector. Similarly, the SDG 12 to 15 all deal with sustainability elements, which is the domain of the civil space sector, where the civil government shall have to be responsible for financing and development of specific space science payloads to their needs, Metal or development of meteorological satellites, and land mapping payloads. This should be their domain, and they should excel in that area. And then the SDG 16, which implies, which amply justified technologies necessary for peace and security. And the typical reactionary spontaneity that is always so evident in most of our defense endeavors, it is time to replace this with what we call as intelligent, responsive space technologies, or IRSTs. As part of a broader, defense, space, science, and technology program that should be implicitly part of the space policy. That will give it transparency and legitimacy to our space policy. The space sector thrives on legacy, and developing legacy space technologies should have been at the core, at the heart of our space policy. There is no mention of legacy technologies in our space policy at this moment. We can, and if we want, we should be focusing on developing legacy satellite buses for specialized orbital operations, specialized light and lift launch capabilities, and very specialized payloads like bathymetrics, LIDARs, aerosols, and above all, a global space situational solver of our own, 
so that we can be that we can be at the cutting edge of the space technologies with the help of our space policy finally as i say and justifies means pakistan's national space policy must be meant to pave the way for an ultimate objective of becoming a space power the word space power does not appear in the space policy and that should happen over the next 3 to 4 decades only by defining this very clear end in our policy shall we be able to track back to realistic process mechanisms technologies and applications that will justify this end in the end i would say that the national space policy 2023 is a very good step in the right direction it should be a country wide activity not just if confined to a agency with a continual improvement process to transform our space policy into a technology trove there is definitely a sad need for a second reading of the national space policy as and when it is it can be made available thank you very much sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Sroosh, for giving us a very comprehensive uh, overview of how these technologies uh, can be utilized for sustainable development and how we can change and modify our policy uh, to accommodate these concerns and these objectives. Uh, with this, uh, now we'll move to our next speaker, and our second speaker is Dr. Adil Sultan. Uh, Dr. Adil Sultan is Dean of Faculty of Aerospace and Security Studies. Air University Islamabad. Previously, he has worked as Pakistan Strategic Plans Division for over 14 years. Uh, he was a visiting research fellow at the War Studies Department, King's College London, uh, visiting research fellow at the International Institute for Interna uh, Strategic Studies, London, and uh, visiting fellow of Henry L. Stimson Center. I now hand over the floor to Dr. Adil for his remarks. Sir. Thank you, Kasim Sahib. <laughs> Thank you, ISSI. DG Saab and Chairman Saab for giving me this opportunity to speak on this issue. Uh, at the beginning, let me say that to state that I am not a space scientist, so I am a social scientist. So I look at these issues from a from an academic perspective. Uh, my talk may appear to be provocative and critical about Pakistan space policy, but that. In, by no means I want to undermine the good work that Sparco does or the other national institutions, they are doing it. My topic is Pakistan's space policy, the way forward. So, as we all know that space has emerged as the new domain for competition, which is likely to intensify with its growing use for commercial as well as military purposes. States that have developed their capacity are shifting focus from geopolitics to astropolitics for their socio-economic and security needs. This competition is not limited to the state actors, but several non-state entities, such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Atlantic, etc., are competing in this evolving space race, mainly for commercial interests. Pakistan that started its space program ahead of India has not been able to make progress for the past several decades for various reasons. <clears throat> While India has managed to land on moon and enter the Mars orbit, Pakistan has yet to develop its space industry and continues to remain dependent on external assistance for the development and launch of its satellites. In December 2023, Pakistan finally announced its first space policy to provide direction to the future space pursuit. But the document that has been made public lacks clarity of purpose and remains ambiguous on many key issues. The document outlines a space vision for exploiting science and technology to improve the quality of life while safeguarding national interest and sovereignty. It encourages indigenization and private sector participation, but there is no strategy in the policy document that could provide a roadmap for achieving the stated objectives. The guidelines section outlines the functions of the National Space Agency, which is SPARCO. It talks about the space legislation that would be drafted sometimes in the future. On funding, SPARCO will be supported by public sector development programs, PSDP, and other relevant entities. But keeping into consideration the economic crunch, this seems to be a very difficult proposition. The policy document talks about public-private partnership, but mainly as users of the satellite services. 
and not as partners in the development or launch of satellites. For the implementation and monitoring of the space policy, SPARCO has been designated as a national space agency with no independent regulatory authority. It is not clear how SPARCO that has been made responsible for all aspects of space program would be able to attract private businesses and engage into public-private partnerships without a clear separation of civil and military programs, especially when it remains under the U.S. entity list and is part of Pakistan's National Command Authority. A brief comparison of Pakistan's space policy with India's space policy of 2023 may offer some useful lessons that Pakistan would could consider to achieve its desired objectives. Unlike Pakistan, India's space policy document focuses mainly on the commercial applications of space and provides a coherent strategy to pursue socio-economic development goals. India's space policy clearly identifies the role of various entities that have been placed under the Department of State, which works under the Prime Minister. The first is the Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center in space, which is a single window agency for authorization of space activities by the government as well as non-government entities. A separate entity has been established with the name of New Space India Limited, which is responsible for commercialization of space technologies. India has also established Defense Space and Research Organization which focuses on the military application and it's a separate entity. This relatively new an, uh, organization is a tri-services uh, entity with members from the scientific organizations, including ISRO. The role of India's space research organization is now confined to research and development of new space technology and its applications. Through this segregation, India has been able to make significant progress in commercial as well as military applications of space technology. Despite being a late starter, it has made rapid progress over the past few years and has become the fourth country to have landed on moon and also the fourth one besides Japan, United States and the European Space Agency to have uh, launched exploratory missions to study the sun. Now a few words about space and geoeconomics. Uh, the global space economy that was estimated at $447 billion in 2020, uh, but we saw this in 2022, it was about $547 billion, as Ms. Ghazala highlighted. This is predicted to increase to more than $1 trillion by 2040. Countries that have the capacity to provide satellite launch services are likely to be the major beneficiaries of this fast expanding space economy. Building on Mackinder's Heartland theory, some scholars are of, the, are of the view that whoever would control the low Earth orbits in space will control the world. It is therefore not difficult to comprehend why all major powers are uh, competing for space domination and are taking lead in sending exploratory missions to moon and other planets. India that started its space program one year after Pakistan currently has a share of around 2% in the global space market. It is planning to increase this share to 10% by 2040, which would mean a revenue of $100 billion only through its space program. Due to low cost and ISRO's efficient launch history, it has also emerged as an attractive option for several commercial entities from around the world. India owns about 28 communication satellites that are providing services to the countries in South Asia, the Far East, and Africa, and generating significant revenue from the telecommunication sector. With increase in demand for the fixed and mobile data sharing services for broadband, radio and television broadcasting, Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, live video streaming, 5G technologies, and virtual reality, Satellite broad broadband is expected to generate more than 50% of global space revenue by 2040. As the satellite launch vehicles improve in their performance and capacity, the cost of satellite launch is likely to reduce from $200 million to $60 million and may eventually go as low as $5 million. Mass production of satellites could also reduce the cost of satellite from $500 million to $500,000 
as a result of increase in space activities at a more affordable cost, there would be more opportunities for investment by the private sector. Most countries are encouraging public-private partnerships to reduce the burden on the state. It also offers a useful model for promoting research and competition in the space domain. Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin are few of the examples of public-private partnerships that have brought innovation and competition in the field. SpaceX in 2020 successfully transported two astronauts to the, to the International Space uh, Station in collaboration with NASA. This was a major milestone that has set the precedent for future space activities. Contrary to these global trends, the use of space technologies for commercial purposes in Pakistan remains negligible. With over 240 million population and increasing reliance on space-based space communication and navigation facilities, Pakistan offers huge dividends for the private investors. But this would need a major reset in national priorities. At present, Pakistan is spending around, from the open sources, as I believe, uh, 25 to $30 million on its space program, which is far less as compared to India that spends close to $1.8 billion annually. To compete in the global space economy, Pakistan may have to introduce structural reforms by segregating the civilian and military space agencies, develop a realistic space policy that is in line with the national objectives, and provides incentive for private businesses to invest in the space program. This reset in the national space vision could help earn several billion dollars from the projected global space economy of one trillion dollars by 2040. And without having to build road and rail networks that have been the main thrust of Pakistan's much trumpeted geoeconomic vision over the past few years. Finally, few policy recommendations. Number one, Pakistan has a reasonable technological base that could be used to jumpstart commercial space ventures. This nevertheless requires administrative and structural reforms and a shift for, from military orientation to commercial applications of space technology. Pakistan's National Aerospace Science and Technology Park that has been established by the government of Pakistan under the patronage of Pakistan Air Force, could possibly take the lead in the development and promotion of commercial space technologies. Number two, Pakistan's recently declared space policy lacks clarity and it's, is ambiguous in its objectives. It must clearly delineate administrative hierarchy, identify an independent regulatory authority that could regulate commercial space activities. Third, there is a need to reduce reliance on external support for developing and launch of satellites. Efforts must be made towards indigenization to make the country independent in its space explorations. Fourth, we need to develop expertise in inter international law and participate in global norms that are being developed to regulate space-based activities. At present, this task is mainly done by the diplomats, who are often constrained due to their limited understanding of the technical and legal issues related to the space domain. Fifth, there is also a need for the think tanks and academia to build their expertise on space-related issues and publish credible research that could help create greater awareness amongst the public and policymakers on the significance of space technologies for the socio-economic development of the country. Finally, to conclude, Pakistan has a vast experience of over six decades in space-related uh, research work. If it can reprioritize its efforts and focus more on commercial applications of space technology, it may be able to reap significant dividends from the fast-growing space economy. This, however, would need resources that can only be channeled through public-private partnerships and by creating conducive environment for the commercial entities to invest in the space technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adil Sultan, for giving us a very comprehensive way forward uh, how this policy can be implemented and utilized for the greater benefit of the country. Uh, with this, uh, we'll now move to our uh, next segment, that is our keynote address. And I would like to invite Major General Ahmad Nadeem Mithat for his keynote address. Uh, Major Ahmad Nadeem is an aeronautical engineer with majors in aerospace. He has spent much of his career in research and development establishments 
and has uh, varied experience in managing national research related organizations he remained on the facility, uh, faculty of leading educational institutes of the country including uh, tenure as deputy chairperson senate of institute of space technology he served as chairman pakistan space and upper atmosphere research commission sparco uh, from september 2018 to september 2023 he also held the appointment of president islamic network for uh, space science and technology and oic establishment during this period he also served as chairman asia pacific space cooperation organization uh, from 2019 to 2021 he held distinction of uh, representing pakistan in various international forums including united nations office of for outer space and multinational engagements related with space in us europe china and uh, he is a, a regular speaker at ndu pais ist command and staff college quetta and air war college karachi sir you have the floor now thank you very much <clears throat> bismillahir rahmanir rahim uh, ambassador khalid mahmood chairman board of governors uh, issi ambassador suhail mahmood uh, director general issi Uh, distinguished uh, seminar panelist uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, assalam alaikum and i think it's still good morning uh, i would like to thank institute of barabach ko sir so it's uh, it's afternoon sir so so i would like to thank the institute uh, for arranging this seminar and to uh, invite me as the keynote speaker the topic is not only relevant Uh, but is also extremely important for which the institute merits uh, appreciation uh, the speakers before me have uh, very eloquently and very comprehensively covered the assigned uh, topics i would also endeavor to very briefly give my perspective uh, on those aspects answer some of the questions which were posed in the concept paper and then uh, i would uh, shift to the uh, top uh, topic which was assigned to me which was the future of pakistan space program Uh, and the global trends uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, let me start uh, by the uh, quote of uh, lyndon b johnson he said and i quote that i think that there is something more important than the ultimate weapon that is the ultimate position the position of total control over earth lies somewhere out there in space unquote space sector as highlighted by previous speakers also is one of the fastest growing industries in the world with a value of approximately 500 billion the estimates vary if you look at different sources with a growth rate of about 8% per year it is uh, estimated to reach 1.1 trillion by uh, 2030s uh, traditionally government spending has been mainly focused towards civilian space activities but in the last 2 to 3 years a major shift has been witnessed that is the bias towards the military capabilities this emphasizes the linkage of space with global political milieu while most expenditures is by space faring nations a noticeable number of other countries especially in asia and middle east have not only significantly increased their space budgets but also made or improved existing organizational setups and legislative processes the trend highlights the recognition of space capability as inescapable to protect vital national interest and i think this uh, slide in itself is is an evidence of whatever the wherever pakistan should have been and wherever it is right now so this slide i think in itself is 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 self explanatory <coughs> while usa china and russia are the most advanced countries with respect to the number of assets capabilities and technological prowess europe japan and india have aggressively are also aggressively <coughs> pursuing their space ventures recent soft landings on the moon surface by india and japan are an evidence of the commitment and importance accorded by these countries however this landscape is changing rapidly the share of the leading countries is reducing due to the entry of the new players and increased capabilities and desire of the space faring nation ladies and gentlemen what does 
a national space policy entail? In my opinion, in our specific case, Pakistan is a signatory of all the five UN treaties on outer space. Obligations under these treaties require conformance through national mechanisms. Indispensable for the growth of national space program, it ident identifies strategic direction and ensures conformance of domestic space activities with the international treaties, as was highlighted uh, earlier as well. Pave way for the adoption of the national space legislation to authorize and regulate outer space activities to assist uh, and to nurture the own space industry through public-private partnership as well as to encourage foreign and local investment. This would also ease the burden on the government of Pakistan to fund the national space program. Synergize the space sector with other national policies and initiatives for national development. Promote academia and industry collaboration, and last but not the least, expand international cooperation with other space agencies and organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, the approval and issuance of national space policy and the space activity rules, I believe that whatever discussion has been done up till now uh, misses out the fact that in February this year, that is the same month as we are in today, the, the space policy activity rules have also been issued. And they are, both of these documents are the landmarks in the Pakistan space program. Both these documents will form the cornerstone on which the future space activities will be based. The policy identifies eight thrust areas and gives 12 guidelines covering major sec sectors impacted by the policy. Whereas the rules, on the other hand, provide that necessary authority for implementation of the policy. As it was highlighted that there are certain gaps in the, uh, in the policy and that there should be some independent mechanism for implementation and that SUPARCO being the National Space Agency should not be part of that uh, implementing mechanism. So that is what it is. <coughs> The, uh, the rules which have been formulated, they actually envision the formulation of a Pakistan Space Regulatory Board. Now this Space Regulatory Board will authorize and regulate all matters related to space in the country. So in effect, SUPARCO will be under this board and it will not be there to, uh, to manage all the space matters. So I think the, the, the gaps which were uh, perhaps seen in the uh, policy document will now be fulfilled uh, by these uh, rules which were issued uh, in February this, uh, this year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as already brought out, space technology and its applications greatly improve the socioeconomic development of a country in diverse domains for upgrading the quality of life. Resultantly, commercial benefits, technology spin-offs, and here I give the example of solar panels. Now, solar panels are uh, in use uh, in space for the last maybe five decades, more than five decades. But we see their use now uh, within the uh, commercial and within the domestic use for the last five to 10 years. So things which were developed earlier for space then find their way down for day-to-day uh, -day, uh, usage also. Uh, revenue is also generated uh, through satellite services. Uh, communication services uh, obviously are, take the lead, but obviously remote sensing and navigation. Uh, Pakistan is utilizing the space technologies in various uh, degree in all the experts uh, which are uh, shown uh, on this slide. Uh, if there is some specific question during the question answer session, I can also tell uh, what number of projects, which projects uh, are being uh, handled by SUPARCO at present uh, regarding the socioeconomic uh, development. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, space programs are seen as a symbol of national prestige as they project geopolitical standing and technological competence as well as they possess socioeconomic significance. In the last two decades, the outer space domain has expanded enormously 
involving many new technologies, applications. To date, the international community has not achieved a global consensus on new laws or norms despite efforts to increase transparency in space operations and prevent the placement of weapons in space. <coughs> Pakistan is against the militarization on and weaponization of outer space in all its possible manifestations and is strongly committed to the principle of peaceful uses of outer space. Ladies and gentlemen, space is con congested and contested. With so much interest across the globe, while significant opportunities exist, there are also risks. The major trends, which in my opinion are as shown on the screen, elusive international norms, need for legal frameworks, and especially with this mushroom growth of the commercial sector, there is a need for, for its regulation, uh, not only in Pakistan, but all over the world. The technology uh, proliferation and the advancement which is leading to, beside other things, miniaturization. Now that is leading to the reducing costs, which was earlier hi highlighted by one of the speakers, that it is reducing costs. So now that cost is being reduced because of the advancement in technology. Now that, while that costs are being reduced, actually the competition is being increased. So once the competition is being increased, now then we get into, while this is an opportunity in itself, but then it leads to large number of satellites being launched, and then you have an uh, issue of uh, management of these satellites in various orbits, whether it's, it is the low Earth orbit or the medium Earth orbit or the uh, uh, geo. Uh, space militarization uh, is, 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 a, is a very uh, important aspect which we need to look, uh, look. and we, by, because of this, uh, with whether the weapons are going to transit through space or whether the weapons are going to be employed from space. So both these angles uh, have to be seen. And how does this impact the assets which we have, the vulnerability of the space assets if this, there is space militarization is there? Uh, the exploitation of celestial resources, uh, again, uh, the, uh, we, we are looking at space-based renewable energy, we are looking at space-based agriculture and also mining. Uh, space debris mitigation is, is a great challenge. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a great issue nowadays uh, with all those uh, satellites uh, or, the, uh, or the debris which are now orbiting uh, our atmosphere. Uh, so they are in uh, millions uh, of those uh, particles. Uh, advancement in propulsion systems, uh, again, uh, Dr. Adil highlighted on this aspect. Now we're looking at uh, nuclear-based propulsion systems and ion-based uh, propulsion systems, which will actually enable long uh, uh, travel uh, in space. So they will have, while they have some advantages, they will have some disadvantages. And obviously we are well aware of the uh, space-based telescopes, James Webb being uh, the last one which was launched. Uh, so now if you have to look at these trends, so we need a very comprehensive policy framework and then a very effective implementation mechanism so that uh, we can handle all these challenges which are there in the future. For countries like Pakistan, uh, there's a dire need to offset the financial and technological gaps through international cooperation. Space-based Earth observation and communication technologies transcend international <coughs> borders. Hence, these technologies are important tools for bilateral or multilateral cooperation. International cooperation in space is beneficial due to cost sharing, time reduction, and workforce development. It ensures socioeconomic growth of the country and the peaceful uses of outer space. Ladies and gentlemen, space program of any country is reflective of the aspirations and potential of the nation. Similarly, after thorough deliberations at appropriate level, National Space Program 2047 was approved by the National Command Authority in December of 2017. This program is pragmatic and balanced. I use these words very carefully because we need to see, and like you have the first, second slide I showed, 
we cannot afford those budgets which the other countries can, at least in the current time frame. So we need to be very pragmatic as to what are our requirements, and only the essential requirements have to be met first, whereas the less essential, I'm not saying non-essential, I'm saying the less essential can be tackled in the later time frame. So the cardinal principles on which the National Space Program was based was the national pride and ownership, fulfilling the socioeconomic development and national security needs, strategy for development of indigenous capability, economical and efficient program, all encompassing that is satellites, launch capabilities, and space applications, and simultaneous infrastructure and human resource development. So I think if that was the base on which the uh, program was based, the NSP has been conceived uh, in two phases. Uh, phase one is from 2017 to 2030, and the second one from 31 to 2047. As envisioned in the principles, it not only caters for all aspects of space industry, but also includes the human space flight and space exploration. Uh, perhaps these two things which were highlighted are not available in the uh, policy, but they are now available in the program. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, lastly, a few words on the future of Pakistan space program. Uh, I see a very bright future despite the formidable challenges of finances and technology denial. Sound foundations in the shape of space policy and rules have been laid, uh, and the ownership and the commitment of the government are very evident now. And I believe that if this continues, uh, we will uh, progress in this strategically important domain. Some of the steps which I believe uh, should be taken is to capitalize on the national space policy and rules for effective management of the space domain. A regulated sector will surely give us dividends. Emphasis on commercialization, public-private partnership, and foreign direct investments to reduce dependence uh, of the shrinking PSDP funding. Enactment <coughs> of one window and investment-friendly uh, mechanism has to be there. And over here, I would just like to uh, highlight that the Indian space policy was issued uh, in April of last year. And it essentially focuses on this uh, aspect of commercialization and foreign direct investment. And why? Uh, because this happened because they had earlier issued regulations based on for the, uh, for the communication uh, sector and for the remote sensing sector earlier. So those regulations already existed uh, in the uh, Indian case. So only their, their space policy now focuses on the commercial aspects. Whereas we did not have any such document earlier, so the Pakistan space policy is now a, a, a sort of a, a combined effort uh, which both identifies the, the regulations part which were not there earlier, and also highlights the importance of uh, these aspects. In my opinion, uh, the focus on uh, indigenization uh, to offset the technological denial and export restrictions, and obviously the capacity building of the local industry. Now, this is very important. Space is the cutting edge of all technologies. And all of us are aware of the uh, technological base which the country has. So till the time we, the, 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 the space industry is not supported by the national industrial base, uh, it will be very difficult. So this uh, policy also identifies uh, that how we need to actually raise the standard of the uh, local industry. And over here, I normally give the example that in a satellite, the part which is facing the sun, and these figures which I'm going to give are indicative, they're not exact. So the side which is facing the sun is approximately is facing 100 degrees centigrade temperature, whereas the side which is in the shadow is at minus 100. So now if you have to uh, 
send an object in space which is supposed to stay there for anything between 3 to 15 years. So it needs to be that high standard. So to make those uh, equipment and items and assemblies of those standards, we need to have very good industrial base here in the country. And uh, finally, enhanced collaboration with friendly countries, uh, joining regional blocks, I think, is, is another solution which we must look into, that how we can offset our uh, 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 disadvantages and uh, gain from that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the end, I would once again thank the Institute uh, for affording me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this important uh, topic. Uh, thank you very much.